Okay. Okay. So. Okay. So welcome everybody to our first seminar in a um, in a little while. So we're really excited to have um, Philip Candelis talk to us today, all the way from Oxford in in the UK. Um, Philip is pretty much Philip and Zenia. They're pretty much my academic parents. So I've known them for a, a reasonable. <laughs> Probably too, probably tells me how old I am to think back to when I first met Philip. But it's about 2008, and I was a young student visiting Oxford, giving a giving a talk, and um, sort of I think they really took me under their wing. So I'm for me personally, I'm really excited to have uh, Philip talk to us today, um, and hopefully uh, Zenia Zenia's listening in too. So that's good. Um, so without. I don't think Philip really needs too much more, well, too much of an introduction. Um, anything to do with Calabi manifolds, mirror symmetry, Philip has been at the forefront of, um, along with Senya and other collaborators. Um, and today he's going to tell us about periods, black holes, and the arithmetic of Calabi manifolds. So over to you, Philip. Okay. Well, thank you, Jock, for the kind words. Um, I'm not sure exactly uh, who the who is in the audience. I'm sort of assuming that there are more physicists than mathematicians. So, uh, for the mathematicians, let me make a simple, uh, a single apology, which is that that I will say some things that are, are very elementary, um, and I hope that you're not too bored, um, especially at the beginning. Um, I will then come on to say some more physics-y things at the end, towards the end to do with black holes, um, which uh, would be interesting, I think, for both in, um, mathematicians and, and physicists. So let, let me start and uh, say that everything I'm going to say is joint work, and um, it's joint work with Zenia Dugo van Straten and uh, Mohamed Elmi, uh, previously my student. Um, and further work with Zenia and uh, Dugo, uh, which appeared rather recently, appeared in April. Um, and the other work uh, appeared in 2019. Okay, so let me start off with some very elementary things. And um, if you're a physicist, then, then please bear with me in, in that we'll say some things I think that are interesting uh, as we go along, but indulge me for a moment. And um, so consider a, a very simple manifold, which is x squared plus uh, y squared is one as in our, as in our diagram over here. And we say a point xy is rational if both x and y have rational values. So um, if x and both little x and little y have rational values, you can write them as a ratio of integers, and we can choose a common denominator. So we can write uh, little x is big x over big z and uh, little y is big Y over big Z, and then um, x squared plus y squared is z squared is the equation. And we want to find solutions of x squared plus y squared is z squared in integers. Now, this case is uh, very simple because in fact, there's a formula. So if you use the half angle formula, then you write x is one minus t squared over one plus t squared, and y as here is 2t over 1 minus t squared. And then you, you do an ele most elementary piece of algebra. You see that x squared plus y squared is 1. And uh, if t is rational, then both x and y are rational. And in fact, this gives a complete solution to uh, this problem that we set ourselves of finding all the rational points. All the rational points can be expressed in this way. And by choosing simple, um, by, by choosing rational numbers for t, of course, there are infinitely many choices for t. Uh, 
Uh, by by uh, choosing a rational t, you get a, a rational point, and you get also a Pythagorean triple x squared plus y squared is z squared. So um, I won't stop to find the t, but there's a certain t that gives you three, four, five as this uh, Pythagorean triple. And if you spend a couple of minutes on this, you can discover infinitely many solutions to this uh, equation x squared plus y squared plus is z squared. And so, you know, if the conversation lags at a drinks party or something, you can point out that you can give sort of surprisingly large values for x, y, and z and point out to your friends that that's a Pythagorean triple. Um, I won't do it, but, but you, you, you can do it fairly easily. Okay, so that was good, right? Um, but here's something that's not so obvious. What about if the equation was x squared plus y squared is three? And um, what we're going to do is now show that in fact, there are no rational points on this curve. So the argument proceeds in two steps. First, we observe that of course, if X and Y are rational, we can write them as ratios of integers as before. And so we're now led to the equation over here that X squared plus Y squared is three Z squared. And we might as well assume that X, Y, and Z have no common factor because if they have a common factor, we can divide it out. Okay, and so the first observation is this one, which is that neither x nor y is divisible by three. Because suppose the contrary, suppose x is divisible by three, say, then you write x is three xi, and then taking x to the other side of the equation, we have that y squared is three z squared minus x squared, which is now nine xi squared. So y squared is definitely divisible by three and three is prime. So if three divides y squared, then three has to divide y. And so y is now three eta. So y, if x is divisible by three, then y is also divisible by three. And now we write three z squared is x squared plus y squared and x squared becomes nine psi squared and y squared becomes nine eta squared. You divide by three. So we're now left with z squared is three psi squared plus three eta squared. And so now z squared is divisible by three. And so three divides z. And therefore x, y, and z are all divisible by three. And that contradicts the assumption we made at the beginning that x, y, and z had no common factor. Okay, so we've now established that neither x nor y are divisible by three. So now consider the equation x squared plus y squared is three z squared modulo three. So modulo three, that becomes the equation x squared plus y squared is zero. And x modulo three is zero, one or two. But in fact, it's not zero because we've just said that x cannot be divisible by three. So x is one or two. And if x is one or two, then x squared is one. Either way, x squared is one mod three. And similarly, y squared is one mod three. So x squared plus y squared is two mod three and now this equation contradicts that one. So um, we have seen that x squared plus y squared is three has no rational points. So as real manifolds, x squared plus y squared is one and psi squared plus eta squared is three are the same manifold because, uh, well, you simply make the change of coordinates, psi is x root three and eta is y root three, and, and they're, they're, they're the same manifold. But as rational manifolds, they're different. So um, a rational manifold, so what we want to consider a rational, what, what we mean by a rational manifold is, or manifold defined over Q, is that, 
you're allowed rational functions. So you can do this for polynomials or ratios of polynomials where the coefficients in the polynomials are themselves rational numbers. And so um, this is as real number, as real manifolds, these two manifolds are the same, but as rational manifolds, they're different because um, you can't write them in, you can't write the relation between them in terms of rational functions with rational coefficients. The root three, of course, is, is not rational. So one way to look at this is that you're talking about a finer level of structure that these manifolds are all the same as real or complex manifolds in the case that they are complex manifolds, but they're different as the, the rational structure is different. They're different as rational manifolds. And we've seen this before um, in that, uh, or we've seen this sort of phenomenon before where you have two manifolds that are the same as real manifolds, but are different as complex manifolds, for example. So you have a big family of quintic calabi yau manifolds. All these are the same as, uh, all these are diffeomorphic as real manifolds, but as complex manifolds, they break up into a 101 parameter family of, of complex manifolds as we know. So uh, this is a, a, a finer level of structure. And then, and then the interesting question is, does, is there some benefit in this finer level of structure in considering calabi yau manifolds over different fields or in considering manifolds over different fields, does this make a difference to physics? And uh, the answer is that I hope to convince you later on that it does. And um, let's just proceed. So now we've got a quick lesson in field theory for physicists. Okay, so here I just, I, I, I want to talk about fields. So I ought to say what a field is or remind you what a field is. So a field is a set of numbers, which is sort of modeled on the reals or the complex numbers or the rational numbers um, for which two operations are defined. You have a plus and a times and F is an abelian group with respect to plus. And because it's an abelian group, because it's a group, then you have a neutral element um, and the neutral element is usually called zero. So um, you've got a zero and you don't expect zero to have a multiplicative inverse, but any, uh, any non-zero number is supposed to have a multiplicative inverse. So you say that, that F minus zero is an abelian group with respect to times. And because we've said group, then the operations have inverses. So um, apart from being able to add and multiply, you can also subtract and divide. So any non-zero element is supposed to have uh, uh, an inverse and multiplicative inverse. Now, all the usual things are fields. R is a field and C is a field and the rational numbers are a field. Z, the integers are not a field um, because the inverse of an, of an integer is not an integer. But there are other things that are fields. So Q extended by root two, say, which is the set A plus B root two, where A and B are rational, is a field. And the point that needs checking, for example, is that every number has an inverse. Every non-zero number has an inverse. And one over A plus B root two by multiplying by the, by a minus b root two, we get the formula that's a minus b root two over a squared minus two b squared. And then there's this pretty fact that the 
the denominator is never zero. This is always defined, the denominator is never zero, precisely because two is never the square of a rational, two is not the square of any rational number. Right, for the, for the denominator to vanish, you would have to have the a squared over b squared was two, and uh, that's not possible for a and b rational. So the inverse always exists. So let's see what it is. Now, another interesting field, are the, well, the other interesting fields are the finite fields. So let's start with FP. FP is the set of integers mod P. I suppose it's the set that uh, a physicist would call ZP. Um, and that's a field for P prime. And P has to be prime because if P fat were to factorize, so if P is not prime, then it factorizes. So, for example, the integers mod 6 are not a field because you would have the equation 2 times 3 equals 0. 2 times 3 is 6, and 6 is the same thing as 0. So um, neither 2 nor 3 could have an inverse. Let's look at F7 as 7 being sort of the smallest random prime. And... Um, so this is the, the set of integers mod seven. And so uh, I've given a small table and each of these you see has an inverse. So for example, um, two times four is one. So four is the inverse of two. And then three times five is, is, is uh, one. And uh, similarly, six times six is, is one mod, mod seven. Um, it's interesting while we're writing a table to write down a table for x squared. And so if we square each of these x's, then you square one, you get one, you square two, you get four. If you square three, you get nine, which is two. If you square four, you get 16, which is also two, uh, 25. Uh, five squared is 25, which is four, and six squared is 36, which is one. So notice that in the bottom row, we've got zero, one, two, and four. So zero, one, two, and four are squares, and uh, three, five, and six are not squares. So there's no number that squares to six, to, to six and there's no number that squares to three, say. Um, so you can have a field with seven squared elements, which is that you can consider all combinations A plus B root three, where A and B are in F7, say. And um, then there are 49 such numbers. And each one of these has an inverse for the same reason that the rationals extended by root two have an inverse, that there's no, there's no number that squares to three. I mean, we chose the, th the, the root three precisely because it was a non-square. Okay, and this generalizes, you can choose a polynomial irreducible with, you can choose a polynomial with coefficients in FP, which is irreducible over FP, doesn't factorize. And you can use the roots of this polynomial to extend the field. And so you can, you can do this for every degree. And so there's a field F with, with P to the K elements for each P and each K. And these are precisely all the finite fields. And the other beautiful thing is that they're unique. So we could have chosen in the previous example, we could have extended by root three or root five or root six. Um, but you can show that the resulting object is, uh, are iso the resulting objects are isomorphic as fields. So 
you can have the field uh, fp to the k, and there's precisely one such um, for each p and k. Okay. And now I want to go off onto the Frobenius map. So I recall Fermat's little theorem, and that says that c to the p is c mod p. And so I can get, I won't attempt to, it, that's very easy to prove. You think about it for a minute, it's very easy to prove by induction on c. And, uh, but as I like to say, I mean, a physicist's proof is to observe that three to the fifth, say, is 243, which is indeed three mod five. So um, it, 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 it is in fact true. Um, now, if we work in FP, where we can work with numbers that are considered mod P, then we simply have the equation that C to the C, to the P is, uh, is C. Um, and what's the corresponding relation in FP to the K? Then it's a, a slightly more general relation. It says that C to the P to the K is C. So I say this for the following reasons. So suppose that alpha and beta are two numbers in fp to the k for some k, then alpha plus beta raised it to the power p, and this just means you write multiply, raising something to the power me, p just means precisely that, you multiply it by itself p times. Uh, alpha plus beta to the p is alpha, to the p plus beta to the p. And if you haven't seen this before, then it's wonderful, right? This is secretly what you've always wanted to write. Um, and of course, this is true because all the intermediate, it requires some thought actually, all the immediate intermediate numbers when you multiply up by the binomial theorem uh, contain p as a factor and so vanish. Okay, uh, this only works because P is prime. All, the, all this only works if P is prime. Okay, so now from this very simple observation, consider some polynomials. So now we're coming back to manifolds. So think of a, a manifold, say the quintic, the quintic threefold is defined by a polynomial F. And so we're going to write this in sort of multinomial notation. X to the M is X1 to the M1, X2 to the M2, up to Xn to the Mn. And the C, so M is a vector in this, and the Cm are the coefficients labeled by M. And we'll let the coefficients be in Fp. So each C is in Fp, but the X can be in, fp to the k for some k. So it's, it's quite common to consider polynomials where the coefficients are rational, say, but the roots of the polynomial are in some higher field. So for example, you could have x squared in one variable, x squared minus two is zero, uh, this is a polynomial with rational coefficients, but the roots of the polynomial, they're not rational. The roots of the polynomial, they're in the reals or in Q extended by root two, or whatever you, 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 you want to say. Okay, so it's quite common, or, or you could have X squared plus one is zero, where again, the, the uh, Polynomial has rational coefficients, but the root, but 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 the roots exist in the complex numbers, not in the roots. Okay, so this is a sort of a familiar construction. You you consider polynomials with coefficients in one field, but which have roots perhaps in a higher field. Now, if f of x is zero, then I multiply it by itself p times, and I know that f of x to the p is zero. And by Fermat's little theorem, which applied 
we showed you to the, the uh, alpha plus beta to the p is alpha to the p plus beta to the p. And of course, you can go from two, you, you, you could write alpha plus beta plus gamma to the p, and that would be alpha to the p plus beta to the p plus gamma to the p. So the p extends to every term, but then c to the p is c because c was in fp. So what you discover is that if f of x is zero, then f of x to the power p is zero. And this means that the map x goes to x to the p um, is an automorphism of the manifold. And it's not the identity because x to the p is not in equal to x in general. So this is interesting. So if you have a manifold defined over FP, then every such manifold has a, a, a non-trivial automorphism. Um, and this is the, the, the Frobenius map. So this is something that, that, that happens over finite fields, over every, for every manifold defined over a finite field, which doesn't happen over the reals or the complex numbers. There's no analog of this. Well, there is an analog, but there's no. There's no very good analog over the over, over the reals or the, the complex numbers. So the Frobenius map is an automorphism that every x defined over f to the p has. And it's always interesting to know what the fixed points are. So the fixed points are the x's for which x to the p equals x. And these that relation defines an fp sitting inside fp to the k. So the Right, so the FP points, the FP rational points, are the are, are, are fixed points that Frobenius map, but the X's that lie in higher fields are not in general, not in general uh, fixed points. And the fundamental sort of invariant of these manifolds is to count rational points over every field. So let nk be the number of points in fp to the k that satisfies f of x is zero. And if these are projective, um, if these are projective equations, then you count the projective points as different. Okay, and these nk's, so uh, n1 were the fixed points of, of, of the Frobenius map. And in fact, these nk's uh, count the fixed points of the kth power of the, of the Frobenius map. Okay. Now, these numbers nk are important and it's good to gather them into a generating function. So uh, you start with a manifold x and you make a zeta function for x. And we make that by taking the sum of nk t to the k over k, t is a formal variable, uh, sum from one to infinity, and then take the exponential of that. So that gives us this, this zeta function here. Oh, now I need to... Change, oh, that's better. So um, that gives us the zeta function. And why is it called a zeta function is the first point. And then, so suppose x is a, the, a trivial manifold, suppose that x is a point, then n to the nk is one for all k. There's only one point um, and there's one point over every field. Then, um, Zeta for a point is just then the sum, 
the exponential of the sum of t to the k over k, and the sum of t to the k over k is minus log of one minus t. So this is just one over one minus t as we have here. And if you take this zeta function and you replace t by p to the minus s, so pick a, pick a prime, write t as p to the minus s, and then take the product of these objects over all primes. And then you get, so now you get the product over all primes, one over one minus p to the minus s. And as Euler taught us, when you rearrange this product, you get the sum of one over n to the s summed over n. And that is precisely Riemann's zeta function. So that's the connection with more familiar zeta functions. And, and uh, of course, there's wonderful mathematics associated with uh, the zeta function. And in particular, there's a famous unsolved problem, which is that, that uh, the zeros, the non-trivial zeros of the zeta function lie on a line. And if you can actually prove that, I mean, that's been check to incredible numbers of roots by computer. But um, <clears throat> if you can actually prove that all the zeros lie on the line, then it's, it's one of the millennial problems and you get a you get million dollars. Um, but that in fact is only one of infinitely many problems because you can associate a zeta function with any manifold of which Riemann zeta function is, is sort of the simplest example. And for each of these manifolds, there's a corresponding problem where the, the zeros lie on certain lines and um, it's an unsolved problem that they in fact, uh, so it's conjectured they lie on certain lines. No one's ever found a counterexample, um, but no one has proved that they all lie on these, on these lines. So there's a, a Riemann a zeta function problem for each of these, uh, each of these zeta functions. Okay, so just carrying on, if X is an elliptic curve, as sort of one dimensional manifold, then you can show that the zeta function for an elliptic curve has this very simple form. It's a rational function. Uh, both the top and the bottom are quadratics in T and um, the denominator is, so to speak, trivial and the numerator is slightly non-trivial in that there's an unknown coefficient or there's a coefficient that varies from case to case, which is this coefficient alpha p, alpha sub p. It depends on p and it depends on which elliptic curve you're talking about. Now, this is sort of deceptively simple, but um, Famously, Breuil, Conrad, Taylor, and Wiles proved that every elliptic curve is modular. And one consequence of this is that for every elliptic curve, there's a modular group, gamma zero of n, that's a subgroup of SL2z. So there's an integer n and a, 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 a subgroup gamma zero n of SL2Z and also weight to modular form G such that G is the sum of alpha to the n, Q to the n. And the non-trivial statement is that the alpha, of course, among the alpha to the n's are, alpha, uh, are, are the ones for which n is P for each prime and those coefficients are those coefficients. So out of nowhere, so to speak, has appear, have appeared sort of modular forms and modular functions, modular groups. Um, 
and this is true for every elliptic curve. And this goes very deep because, in fact, uh, Fermat's the Fermat hypothesis uh, can be proved rather straightforwardly given this fact that the hard part in Weil's proof of the Fermat conjecture was showing that every elliptic curve is modular. Once you have that, um, you have a proof of the Fermat conjecture because if there's a counter, you can show that if there's a counter example to the Fermat conjecture, then from that counterexample, I can construct a certain elliptic curve, the Frey curve, and rather easily show that the that elliptic curve is not modular, and that contradicts the fact, the, the theorem by Bray, Conrad, Taylor, and Wiles, that all elliptic curves are modular. So this goes very deep. And so this zeta function is a wonderful thing, and it has a lot of importance in, 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 in number theory. Um, and more is known. So going on for, to more general manifolds, the form of the zeta function is governed by the, the Vey conjectures, which are a set of conjectures which have now been proved, and I won't even spell them out um, in full, but one of the consequences of the conjectures is that zeta is always a rational function, so it's always a ratio of two polynomials, a numerator over a denominator, and moreover, the, both the numerator and the denominator factorize, and they factorize into these polynomials R1, R3, R0, R2, so on, where the degree, they factorize over the integer, integers into these polynomials, and the degrees of the polynomials are given by the Betty numbers. So although this manifold is just a bunch of points, nevertheless, it knows about the Betty numbers, um, and it knows about the cohomology, as I say, bit more in just a second. So um, it factorizes into polynomials whose degrees are the Betty numbers and you have the odd Betty numbers occurring on all the, the, the cohomology groups of uh, odd degree occurring on the top line and the, uh, the cohomology groups of even degree occurring on the bottom line. And in fact, this formula was proved by Dwork by showing that these polynomials, the RKs, are just the determinant of one minus T times the inverse of the Frobenius map. Um, so the Frobenius map is what we said. I suppose the surprising thing is that although this manifold is just a bunch of points, <clears throat> you can define cohomology you can define a cohomology on this, and you can define cohomology groups on this, and the Frobenius operator, the Frobenius map, then acts on the cohomology groups. And uh, then uh, you can uh, as, as, then you can show that the RK is the, the characteristic polynomial of this of this operator as it acts on the cohomology groups. And, and so uh, the cohomology group is a finite thing. So uh, <clears throat> this Frobenius is then just a finite matrix <clears throat> and the determinant is a finite determinant. Okay, and more is true um, for, for uh, a one parameter Calabi-Yau manifold, then we have uh, one parameter Calabi-Yau manifold, we would have that, uh, Well, first of all, we have B1 is B5 is zero. So in fact, the polynomials R1 and R5 are trivial, they're just one. And we also have 
that um, well, okay, subject to slight proviso, which I won't mention. The uh, denominator here is very simple. So uh, the denominator just breaks up as, as, as shown, uh, one minus t, one minus pt, one minus p squared t, one minus p cubed t. <clears throat> the interest then just lies with this object here, R3. So there's a, uh, and we have that for one parameter manifold, oh, this is what I wanted to say, one parameter manifold, then B3 is four. And so R3 is then a quartic polynomial. So everything comes down to a quartic polynomial, R3. Okay, so I want to apply this to the study of attractor points. And so let me just run over the attractor mechanism while standing on one leg. Okay, so um, we want to describe a black hole in supergravity. And um, <clears throat> we want to describe a supersymmetric vacuum in which the four space is not Minkowski's four space, but the four space is a four dimensional Minkowskian manifold, um, but which represents a, a, a spherically symmetric black hole, say, to make things simple. And so the full space is given by a metric as shown involving some function u of r. Uh, it's spherically symmetric, so all the action it takes place as a function of r. And instead of having a product of such a space with a Calabi-R manifold, now you have a Calabi-R manifold fibered over every point of this space. So if you like, the Calabi R manifold also depends on the radius. Really, because everything depends on the radius, really you can think of these things as being, these manifolds as being fibered over a line. So you, you have a, a, a series of manifolds X of phi and phi is a function of R. So if you like, you can think of R as the parameter of the, of the manifold. <clears throat> Okay, so type two supergravity is not just gravity, it's gravity with extra U1 gauge fields. Uh, so extra copies of electromagnetism, if you like. And the black hole has both electric and magnetic charges. So ele uh, electric charges QA and magnetic charges PB. <coughs> and the indices run over zero to H21 of X, H21 being the Hodge number. And because you have both electric and magnetic charges, then these have to be integers. So given that, it's interesting to think of the charges as forms or elements of cohomology because you can, for example, um, in homology, you can take a symplectic basis, capital A, capital B, and you can form an element in the integral cohomology of X, uh, as shown for little gamma. And there's a dual element in the, what you would call the integral cohomology, um, which is formed by taking a basis of forms, alpha and beta, dual to A and B in the usual way, and uh, forming the, the uh, charge vector gamma, which is an element of, in this integral cohomology. Now, the integral cohomology is a lattice. So you're allowed integer combinations of the basis vectors. 
Uh -huh. But before we come on to that, there's, I suppose, a, a, a one-page summary of, of uh, special geometry as it relates to this situation. So you have a holomorphic three-form uh, capital omega. There's a natural Kähler form on the moduli space, which is given by e to the minus k is minus i times the integral of omega wedge omega bar. Uh, the metric on the moduli space is given by the derivatives of, of, of the Kähler potential. And there's an, an interesting extra quantity called Z here, which is given a cycle gamma. So gamma was a, a, a three cycle. So given a, a cycle gamma, you can define something that's more or less a period, or it would be a period, but it gets modified by this factor of e to the k over two, where k is the k the potential. So this is the this is known as the, the central charge. And we have a metric for the full space, which we wrote down previously, and the condition that the entire manifold, the full space with the Calabi R manifolds fibered over it, that the entire 10 dimensional manifold is supersymmetric, boils down to a set of equations that relate phi and R and U and, uh, and U and R. So relate everything to, to R and to write the equations neatly, then it's usual to um it's usual to introduce another coordinate rho which is one over r and then you uh, you write these two equations so you have differential equations which you can solve and so one of these equations gives you phi as a function of r and the other one gives you u as a function of r. And they're equations which are nonlinear and difficult to solve except with a computer. But they have the interesting property that there's a condition, of course, which is that the at the horizon of the black hole, you don't want the space to be singular. So we have 10-dimensional space, and of course, the thing we all believe is that nothing special, so to speak, happens at the horizon. The curvature is not infinite at the horizon. And this forces you to pick a special value of phi, call it phi star, at the horizon. And so that's interesting. You have a, a certain fixed manifold at the horizon, but if you're a, a light year away from the black hole or many light years away from the black hole, then of course you don't care whether the black hole is there or not. And so a long way from the black hole, you should be free to have a vacuum, which is just flat space with any Calabi owl over it. And so, the value of phi at infinity shouldn't matter. And so uh, you should have a solution for any value of phi at infinity. So the equations have this attractor property, which means that under at least under small variations of phi or smooth variations of phi at infinity, the equations involve when you integrate in R and you integrate down to the horizon, they involve in, evolve in such a way that no matter where you start, you always end up at the same value of phi star. So phi star in this sense is an attractor point that the, the trajectories all flow into, all into flow, flow into phi star. Okay, and what's the special property of phi star? Well, phi star has a property you can show that if you take this charge vector p alpha minus q beta, then this has to be include. This has to be, lie in h three zero plus h zero three for that value of phi star for that complex structure. Of course, what you mean by h three zero depends on the complex structure. Um, and so uh, H30 plus H03 changes as you vary the complex structure, but 
for the special complex structure at the the special complex structure at the horizon has to be such that the charge vector lies in H30 plus H03, or equivalently said that the 2, 1 component of gamma vanishes in the complex structure specified by phi star. Okay, so here's a picture. You have some, uh, some element gamma in a lattice in, in, in the uh, integral cohomology, and you have H30 plus H03, which is a two plane thought of in. Uh, so let's think of our one parameter family. We have a four dimensional space. In that space, H30 and H03 are each one dimensional. So the sum of the two is a plane. And that plane is, is generated either, you can think of it as being generated by omega and omega bar, or you can think of it as being generated by the real and imaginary parts of omega. And so there you have some plane, and this blue plane moves as you vary the complex structure because omega moves. And the question is, does it move in, in such a way that when phi equals phi star, the blue plane contains the red vector? That's the point. And uh, so it's believed that there are many solutions that do that. So you can ask a question at rank one or rank two. Uh, in rank one, you ask, are there, can there be blue planes that contain uh, the red vector, and uh, there are probably many of them because if it contains, if the plane contains the vector, you could see that you could rotate it around a bit, and there would be many, many planes containing the vector. And it's believed that phi's that do this are somehow dense in the parameter space of phi's, though it's it's curious that although these are everywhere, so to speak. Um, no one has an explicit, apart from special cases like conifold points or something, the, the, the non-singular uh, points corresponding to non-singular manifolds are not known. Attractive points corresponding to non-singular manifolds in rank one are not known except in some numerical approximation. No one knows any precisely. It can also happen that this happens in rank two. So it can happen that you can have two separate vectors, gamma one and gamma two, such in the lattice, such that the blue plane contains both. This is something that you would think would never happen and happens only rarely. Um, and we will now give an example of one of these. Okay, so, uh, but it's this business about lattices which brings in the number theory, because um, if you have a lattice, so here I've, I've sketched just a, a two-dimensional lattice. If you have a lattice, then a general line that passes through the origin intersects the lattice in the origin, but it won't intersect the lattice in any other lattice point. Um, exceptionally, it can. So this blue line intersects the lattice point there, uh, the lattice there. And then, but this is exceptional because necessarily, because it intersects the lattice point, then you can see that the slope is, is uh, the slope is necessarily rational. It's a certain number of lattice sites certain number of lattice lengths over, over another number, another integer number of lattice lengths. So the, a line can only intersect the, the lattice if the slope is rational. And uh, this persists not only in two dimensions, but, but in, in many dimensions. There are more slopes, but they have to be rational. So this is where we come to consider whether solutions of an equation exist over the in the rationals 
rather than more generally just in the reals. Okay. In the rank two case, we were asking whether the cohomology group, which is a, 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 a lattice of rank four, splits into two lattices of rank two, one of which corresponds to or coincides with H30 plus H03, and the other one corresponds to H12 plus H21. So we, we were looking for two vectors that lay in H30 plus H03, and the complementary dimensions or the complementary lattice, the orthogonal lattice is H12 plus H21. And so when this happens over the integers, then this Frobenius matrix also splits because we're saying the lattice splits. So there's uh, this matrix, which really is, which you thought of as, as a four by four matrix really becomes a block, a block matrix with two by two blocks and zeros outside. Um, so the, this block and this block are the two blocks indicated are non-trivial and the other blocks are zero. And so when you take this determinant, when you take the determinant, it factors into two quadratic uh, factors. So we look for fact we calculate. So the strategy is we calculate R for many values of P and many parameters. And we look for cases where it factorizes in this form. And the two factors are different. There's an extra P in the, there's an extra P in the second factor. I see I have to rush, but, but uh, that's okay. I'm almost through, I think. Okay, so the strategy is you make tables of this R for many P and phi and look for persistent factorizations. Um, so you make the hypothesis that this is going to happen when phi star is the root of some polynomial, uh, G of phi, and G of phi is a polynomial with rational uh, coefficients. If it has rational coefficients, it has integer coefficients by multiplying through. Okay, so this is the sort of thing that you, you produce. Um, you produce a table of factors r of t for different values of phi. This is, this is the table for p. So there's a particular manifold. I haven't said that. There's a particular manifold that we choose, which was first examined by Hulek and Ferrell. Um, and this is uh, a manifold that's understood. Um, the periods of this manifold are understood um, because, and the Picard Fuchs equation. So the, the manifold has a certain Picard Fuchs equation. The periods are the solution of the, the Picard Fuchs equation. Um, these are understood, and one can calculate. The uh, in ways that I haven't explained, but one can calculate these uh, Frobenius polynomials, the R of T's, in terms of the the periods, um, and one does this. And in general, so for a general smooth point, the factor R is an irreducible quartic, as it is here, for example. Um, but for some cases, the R polynomial factorizes into two quadrics. So I ask you to remember, so here it does it for five cases. It does it for four and five, phi is four, phi is five, phi is eight, also for nine and 11. But I ask you to remember the integers four, five and eight 
for, for a moment. Okay. Now, we do this for 500 primes, starting from uh, P is five. So the third prime, and we go up to the 502nd prime, which is 3583. Um, and for each of these, you make a tape. And the first the sort of the crudest graph is simply to note how many times it factorizes. And we said that for P is 19, it factorized five times. So that's this point here. Um, and then for other primes, it factorizes a different number of times. And the perhaps if this is the first graph you see, then, then possibly you're not surprised. But um, you should be surprised because it factorizes for the hewlett ferrell manifold. That's why we're interested. Uh, for the hewlett ferrell manifold, it factorizes uh, very often. And just for comparison, this, the bottom graph is the same graph, but done for the quintic. And so, of course, you look at it, you see immediately that the quintic factorizes, it factorizes much less often. Um, in fact, for many cases, it doesn't factorize at all. All these points along the axis are points for which no, there is no, there's no factorization into two quadrants. Uh, in fact, that's the, the first clue is that, that, that in this case, there are many cases where no factorization takes place. And for the hewlett ferrell manifold, it, it, it factorizes at least once for every, every prime. Okay. And that's a clue that there's a linear equation that uh, for which it, uh, for whose root it always factorizes. And so you can um, play a game, you can come back here and you can find the cases where it factorizes precisely once and look for phi's for which that happens and look for rational numbers phi for which it happens um, and play some games with the Chinese remainder theorem and you immediately you find very quickly that it always factorizes in the desired way when seven phi plus one is zero. So that's easy or you can just have your computer check you just check linear equations. So you look for a linear factor, a uh, linear equation with, with, with such a phi as, as a root and uh, you just check through possible coefficients in a linear equation. And very quickly you find that when seven phi plus one is zero, then for every P for that value of phi, the equation factorizes. And uh, that's easy. Somewhat harder is you to look for a quadratic equation and, um, this I gave to, to this you give to a graduate student, mm -hmm. and uh, they work work at it for a bit with a computer game. You search uh, coefficients, you pretty quickly find that phi squared minus sixty six phi plus one is when when this quadratic equation is is satisfied, then uh, it also always factorizes. Now, what does it mean? Uh, I'm almost through. Can I take another five minutes? I, I think I'm almost through. Um, if yeah. if if uh, phi is uh, what does it mean? So suppose p is nineteen. Uh, for p is nineteen, you have to realize that seven times eight is fifty six, and fifty six is three times nineteen minus one. And so seven times eight is minus one. So minus a seventh is eight. So eight modulo 19, eight satisfies this equation. And what's more for P is 19, 17, uh, why 17? 17 is because you've got 17 here. What do you mean by root 17? Well, if P is 19, uh, 17 is six squared 
minus 19, 36 minus 19 is 17. So 17 is the same thing as six squared. So root 17 is six, and then five plus or minus is four and five. Oh, and that's interesting because I said, remember eight and remember four and five. So for these values, when phi is, when phi satisfies this equation or phi satisfies the linear equation, you get the factorization that you wanted. And of course, I've just shown this for p equals 19. What's far from clear is you check this for the 500 primes and it always works. Right. So um, you will, whenever this whenever this equation is satisfied, you get factorization. Whenever this equation is satisfied, which is whenever root seventeen is a square, you get you get factorization. Or whenever that that happens, whenever root seventeen is a square, you get a factorization. Okay, and. Once you know that, once you know the value of phi, then you can calculate the flow. You know, once you know phi, you know the charges, um, and you can uh, calculate the attractor flow, then it's very easy. And this is a diagram. So this is the diagram for phi is minus a seventh. Here is phi is minus a seventh. Uh, this is the origin. This is the large complex struct. This one. Is the large complex structure point. The other black dots are like this one. Those are conifold points. Um, you get pretty diagrams like this. And okay, there's there, 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 there's uh, more information in those graphs that I I showed you, um, but I I won't. Um, let me, I'm, I'm over time. So let me just show you these plots. This is actually for a thousand primes. This is the average number of, of factorizations um, in bins of 125 done for a thousand primes. And what happens is you can see that this is, this is coming down and it's a corollary to the These numbers, in fact, give you bounds on the number of factors you can have, the number of irreducible factors that you can have in this polynomial G, capital G of phi, how many equations. You see, I, I, I presented a, a, a linear equation. I said the roots of that correspond to an attractor point, and I presented a quadratic equation, I said the roots of that also correspond to attractive points. You could have said, well, why didn't you try for a cubic equation or uh, a, a higher equation? And the answer is that you can show from the averages that this histogram has to converge to the number of number of irreducible factors. So we have already two irreducible factors, a linear factor and a quadratic factor. And this number is converging and the, it looks compelling that it's converging to two. We know the number has to be at least two because we have two factors, but there's a compelling argument that the number is not three, for example, and so that we found all the solutions. That's the, this is the same thing for the quintic. Notice that the vertical scale is very different here. Okay, it's fairly clear that this is converging to zero. This is also done for a thousand primes. It's converging to zero. So you shouldn't, unless you're a super optimist, you shouldn't look for attractor points of degree two for the mirror quintic, because there probably aren't any. Okay. There's more information in this. When the factorization occurs, it occurs uh, like this. 
And then there are two coefficients that are interesting, this one and this one. And now the story is very similar to the elliptic curve case. There are modular, so for phi equals minus the seventh, say, phi equals minus the seventh, say, there are now modular functions, and you do this by checking the, the tables for each P. There are modular functions F2 and F4, so of weight two and weight four for the group gamma zero of 14, such that F2 is the alpha n sum of alpha n q to the n and f4 is sum of beta n q to the n where alpha p here is the pth coefficient in this sum and beta p is the pth coefficient in that sum so for a physicist the mathematicians expected this this is the said conjecture that it should be like this but uh, for a physicist, uh, modular functions have appeared out of, uh, out of nowhere. Uh, we've associated these with, with black holes and attractive points. Um, let me skip over. Let me skip over most things. Um, Associated with these modular forms, there are L functions, um, which are the Mellin transforms, the modular forms. And at the attractor points, you can evaluate the periods. So the size here are a basis for the periods. There are four periods, Xi0, Xi1, Xi2, Xi3. Um, you can it's a remarkable thing that you can evaluate the periods exactly in terms of, or identify them in terms of the L values um, associated with the modular forms. And um, these are the relations. The, the fact that it was an attractor point meant that there had to be two linear relations between the periods. We said that the, the, the uh, plane had to, co there was a plane and it had to coincide with the lattice plane. And that imposes two linear relations between the periods. And you can see that's true because two of the periods are related to L4 of two and two of the periods are related to L4 of one. Uh, these are different numbers. Um, if you divide through, it's convenient to remove factors of pi from the periods. So you can do this, um, define a psi twiddle to be psi j over pi to the j. And then you get these four, these two relations, which says psi two twiddle over psi zero twiddle is minus a third, and psi three twiddle over psi one twiddle is minus 11 fifths. Of course, the remarkable thing is that you've got four periods, which are solutions to the Picard Fuchs equation. So do you have initial conditions at the large complex structure point? You integrate them out to phi equals minus the seventh, and that there should be two ratios of the periods which are rational numbers is sort of a remarkable and wonderful thing. Okay, and then the last slide, which says that you can pick a basis in the charge lattice. And then, so the general charge then has, is a two parameter family where you have K times one vector plus L times another vector. Now there's a kappa here because you can take the hulot verrill manifold and there are really two manifolds there depending on which symmetry group you divide by. Uh, so kappa can be one or two in here um, and there are two cases, but either way you can take, um, integer combinations of the two lattice spaces vectors. And you can define a number associated with 
the values of the periods at the attractor point, which we're evaluated in terms of these L functions, L41, L42. And then the area of the horizon is written very simply in terms of this number V star. So I think what I've said is the point to remain with you is that if you look at the arithmetic of these manifolds, you can find things like attractor points. And um, having found the attractor points, then numerical sort of numbers, which are very special that come into uh, this with the, with the, associated with these modular groups that you, one has found, um, also enter directly into important quantities such as the formula for the area of the horizon. So I'm over time. I apologize. Let me stop there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Philip. Um, enjoy that. So any questions? Uh, what made you look at this particular Calabiao with these many with this factorization properties? Really, we started with the we were interested in how to calculate these Frobenius polynomials, these R polynomials, in a fast way. I mean, the point was that it was difficult to, they, they, they were at one stage uh, difficult to calculate. Uh, it was a slow process. And uh, you were defeated uh, by quite early. I mean, it got progressively more, it was easy to do for P is five and P equals seven, but for larger values of P, it became progressively difficult. Um, and then we we found uh, a more efficient way of doing it, um, which I haven't described, but and you do this from the periods and you do the periods from the Picard Fuchs equations. So we were interested in calculating, doing this for some examples, which meant going to the list, the AES said list, going to the list of Picard Fuchs equation, picking some interesting Picard Fuchs equations. And from this, we came across this one which is dramatic in that, uh, in that uh, there are many more factorizations. That was the, the point. It turns out that this Hewlett, if you look at how the, the manifolds define, it looks a bit strange. Um, and then after a long time, you realize that the mirror is a familiar manifold. So, it, it, it turn, turns out that the hulot verrill manifold is the mirror of something that, that, that's much more familiar. So, um, but the answer to your question is how did we come across this? Uh, we took the AESZ list and basically started to go through it. That's the, or at least go through examples that were interesting. The ES at least is this Calabia somehow well, how special compared to others? Don't know. I mean, it's special because of this property. How we could have seen that without computing this graph, I don't know. Um, no, I still don't know. Can I make a comment about that? Please. Um, so yeah, so, so there, there is, uh, I think, related to Johanna's question, 
there is a very interesting there is a very interesting question right which is what makes a calabi yao attractive in quotes right meaning a meat that admits uh, attractive points and i think this is the the, the question I, in, in, in essence that's what you're asking and the answer is that we don't know nobody knows at this stage um so um uh there is a, a conjecture in mathematics called the Hodge conjecture that says that these splittings have, um, um, oh, let me explain, <laughs> these splittings have a geometric, uh, 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 most have a geometric interpretation, right? Uh, and, and we haven't been able to find that in the, in, in, even in this case of the hurricane barrel, we haven't been able to find what that geometric interpretation is. Um, uh, so, so there, there must be a geometric reason why this happens, right? So um, uh, there is a different case in which splittings happen, which is when you go to, to a singular point in moduli space, right? Like a, a conical singularity, right? If you look at the zeta function of conical singularities, you find that something interesting happens and there is modularity, in fact, you can make modularity statements. But there we understand the geometry of this and we know what, how these pieces appear, how the, the particular factors appear in the zeta function. We have a geometric interpretation. I mean, that, that's a, a, a matter of another half an hour talk or something. But uh, for this case in which the, the, uh, the tractor points are smooth points in moduli and you have these splittings, there must be a geometric interpretation. We don't know what that is at the moment. We, we don't know, in, in, not even in this case, what happens. So it's, it's a very, very hard question uh, that you're, so you're putting your finger in, in perhaps to me, one of the most interesting questions. I mean, what makes a Calabiao uh, attractive in this sense, right? To have attract, uh, have attract a two attractive points. Okay, that's all I want to say. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Um, I think I've got a stupid question, which is, does, mir does mirror symmetry tell you anything? Well, the answer to that must be, oh, I didn't say. I mean, this leads to, there are other interesting identities that go beyond the ones that we've seen. And um, so, for example, just to say it in words, we did calculate the um, periods. Mm -hmm. And so once you've calculated the periods, of course, as you know, you can calculate a lot of things. So, um, for example, you can calculate the t, and the t coordinate is a ratio of pi one and pi zero, which is related to these size in a certain way. Um, mm. And you get identities. One of these, one of these uh, attractor points is very close to the large complex structure limit. And so the instantons converge. And so you get interesting sums, interesting identities involving the instanton numbers. So somehow these attractor values and the instanton numbers are, are, are sort of also related. Right. But there are consequences. But there's, it, 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 it's again, it's like what say is the sort of things Zenny was saying. I mean, there are general things that I can say are true, that are interesting and remarkable. But there, it's hard to put your finger on on what it is, either in the manifold or in the mirror manifold that that you would have said, aha, this has a an attractor point. 
right? I mean, it's also, these things are also very closely related, almost the same thing as the saying there are flux vacua. Um, right. So again, you have special values of, of the phi's which are, allow you to have flux vacua and so on. But why you could have said, you know, how you could have said, oh, let's look, go out and look for flux vacua or, or let's go out and mm -hmm. look for attractor points and therefore we'll start with this manifold or that manifold. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you do that. Any other questions? Well, if not, we'll um, electronically thank Philip for a lovely talk. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, and we will be in touch with, uh, so our next seminar will be next Friday, not next Friday, <laughs> um, the last Friday of next month, which I believe is the 24th of September. Um, so we'll be in touch in due course with Title One Abstract for that one. But I hope you're all doing well. Um, if you're stuck to your house, be brave. If you're not, enjoy it. Okay. So thank you very much, Philip. Cheers. Thank you.